Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm very sure that you all are keenly interested in when the cloud of uncertainty hanging over the global economy will be cleared. <clears throat> of course, it depends on many things and many factors. Obviously, the, the future of European economies uh, is one of the important critical factor for the global economic recovery. This morning we have the best speaker who will enlighten us again on the current situation of Eurozone and the EU-wide economy. And, and his enlightening views, particularly on the, the current German situation. Uh, the pro professor <clears throat> Paki was with us before, so he doesn't need a long introduction. But I'll just remind you of the fact that uh, he has been the with the uh, uh, University of Magdeburg. Uh, he is currently the uh, uh, Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Management of that university. Uh, he spent <clears throat> uh, many years at the, the well-known Kiel Institute and he was professor and the research director and the, the uh, uh, department head at the Kiel Institute. And Professor Parker uh, turned politician as well. Actually, he is a renowned scholar and a politician in Germany. Uh, from 2002 to 2008, he served as the Minister of Finance of the state of Saxony Anhalt, which uh, is one of the the, the largest uh, state in, in in Germany, and he actually led the liberal fraction in the uh, the Saxony Anhalt Parliament. Uh, I understand that he's a member of uh, Liberal Party uh, in Germany. And uh, some of you must know that the, during the last election, Liberal Party didn't get 5%. So uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has to have a coalition with the uh, Social Democrat rather than Liberal Party. Um, and so there, there must be uh, uh, various uh, interesting political stories uh, uh, to tell us uh, the uh, uh, by the uh, Professor Parker. Well, uh, this morning, as I said again, uh, the earlier he will tell us the current state of uh, Eurozone economy and the EU-wide economy, and then the, perhaps politics in Germany. Well, with this, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Parker. Dear Professor Sakong, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here again. I was here, uh, 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 I think it was June last year, uh, and uh, at that time uh, I was uh, here in my function as a member of the uh, uh, German, uh, Korean German uh, Unification uh, Committee, um, and uh, uh, we arranged a breakfast lecture, and I really loved the discussion and the atmosphere at this breakfast lecture. So when uh, it became clear that I would participate in the Asian Leadership Conference, uh, which took place the last two days uh, in the Shilla Hotel, uh, I um, sent Mr. Sakong a mail uh, asking, on, on relatively short notice, asking whether we should have another breakfast together. And it didn't take uh, more than an hour. I had an answer. Uh, uh, of course, we do. And here we are. It's a great pleasure 
uh, to have breakfast with you uh, again. The last time I talked about German unification, which is of course my major topic here in, uh, when, I, when I come to Korea. Um, I also talked about it uh, yesterday in the Asian Leadership Conference. But uh, 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 today's topic is the Eurozone. Uh, but uh, um, there is a link between the two topics, as you shall see uh, in uh, my talk. Of course, we're going to have a discussion afterwards. I will talk for 45 minutes, roughly. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. And I will not talk much about uh, politics or even liberal politics in my talk. But of course, you are absolutely free to ask questions. Uh, um, uh, about the sorry straight state of the liberals uh, and their, their triumphant comeback in a couple of years. Okay, now um, I have to subdivide my, uh, my talk into five parts. I briefly look back into history of the Euro, into the, uh, the problematic history of the Eurozone in the last decade, uh, looking back at the boom first until 2008, then at the crisis time since 2009. Then I look at the reform performance, which uh, we uh, can trace out so far in the crisis countries. We then ask the question together, uh, do we face uh, in Europe, in the old continent, a divided continent for a long time? Uh, and finally, let me make some remarks about what needs to be done in terms of reforms on the European level, meaning beyond what the national governments do. Now, a bit of history first. Um, when you look back at the time of the last decade uh, um, you, and, and you analyze what was going on, um, the picture is relatively clear. With the benefit of hindsight, of course, the picture is relatively clear. We had in the United States low interest rates after 9-11, 2001. We had a, a, a huge subprime boom. We had a housing price hike in the United States with vast consequences for the world economy because that boom spilled over uh, into the balance sheets uh, of uh, many places in the world. In Europe, we also had a time of low interest rates, first of all due to the fact of the American policy, notably of the Fed, um, uh, uh, Greenspan's uh, uh, um, uh, easy money policy, uh, and uh, uh, second, uh, we of course had low interest rates because of the introduction of the euro. The introduction of the euro meant for the weaker countries in Europe a kind of uh, gain of confidence uh, that uh, the most stable countries in Europe, notably German, Germany, but not only Germany, um, uh, had uh, uh, um, uh, they, they, they borrowed, if you like, the stability record uh, in, the, in, the, in the capital markets and so could uh, uh, good, get good conditions uh, at low interest rate um, for credit. Now, um, the consequence was a real estate boom uh, in the periphery regions of Europe, notably in the south, and with that came a very detrimental, with the benefit of hindsight, a very detrimental um, boom in the non-traded goods sector. Um, we could observe uh, in uh, that period that in the local, regional, national service sectors of the respective periphery countries, uh, notably of Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Ireland, um, real uh, unit labor costs rose roughly by 30% compared to the German level. German unit labor costs at the time were flat. This is an absolutely remarkable achievement that we have very, uh, very moderate wage cost development. And there is one major reason for that. This is unification. Because unification meant that suddenly we had a, a well-educated, highly skilled labor force available for our industry, for our services, uh, which was not available before, and that uh, was, uh, 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 changed the competitive conditions in the labor market, dr markets dramatically and uh, led uh, unions to agree to very moderate uh, wage increases, which ended up, if you look uh, back at it, 
uh, at a, a constant unit labor cost over this time. At the same time, this improvement of the German competitive position meant current account surpluses in Germany and the worsening of the competitive conditions in the periphery countries meant current account deficits and growing current account deficits uh, in uh, the southern countries. Well, in terms of per capita incomes, all this looked fine. It looked like a wonderful convergence of the countries because the, the poorer countries got richer and the richer countries stagnated, if you like. So you got a kind of convergence or the completion of a natural convergence that we have had for a very long time. Um, it was the completion of a long-term trend and everybody expected it to go on. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the big illusion. The big illusion of Europe in the last decade and uh, with the breaking out uh, uh, of the financial crisis in 2008, I think this has fundamentally changed. We now uh, face a situation, uh, I come back to this point later, where we have three groups of countries, um, the industrial innovative core, the northwest, the southern countries, and the eastern countries, which still lag behind uh, in productivity levels, but which did not have um, a boom uh, uh, or a bubble. Uh, so the south had the bubble, the east didn't have the bubble, but uh, both of them are still lagging in productivity. Now uh, let's come to uh, the second uh, part of the story, the crisis, which began from 2009 on. Well, basically, uh, the, the, the usual dating of the beginning of the crisis is Lehman Brothers uh, in September 2008, um, uh, which uh, had vast consequences uh, for uh, uh, capital markets. It more or less immediately led to a widening of the spreads uh, within Europe. Uh, so the spreads had come down completely. It looked as if uh, the markets continuously uh, um, uh, evaluated the risk uh, in the different countries in an ever more egalitarian fashion, and that has completely changed since uh, 2008, 2009. Um, the rating agencies downgraded uh, a couple of countries uh, massively and all this led over the years in 2009, 2010 to an ever more acute crisis situation uh, which uh, finally uh, broke out traumatically in May 2010 with the bailout of Greece. Please note that the disequilibria in the countries uh, where it can be spotted in very different uh, reasons. Greece, for instance, had uh, a huge government deficits in the, uh, 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 in the 2000s already. So it was really, in, in some respects, uh, it's, it's a very bad word, but uh, uh, I use it here, it was a kind of failed state. You know, the tax revenues were much too low. Tax administration was a disaster. The whole admin, public administration uh, is in a very bad shape. The situation in Spain and uh, Ireland was different. Here, the crisis emerged as a consequence of the bank failures uh, and uh, the government stepping in and bailing out the own banks. And uh, um, it's important to re realize that a country like Spain did not have budget deficits and uh, a, a, a debt uh, and a debt GDP ratio that was higher than that of Germany uh, in the last decade. So it was not the profligacy of a government that just spend money, but it was the hostage taking of the government by the banking crisis, which led into the math. Exactly the same story applies for Ireland and for Portugal. It's something like a mixed story. So we have to distinguish each case by its own merits and by its own uh, defaults. 
Now, May 2, 2010 was really a watershed uh, uh, month, or it was even one weekend. I remember it well because it's the birthday of my wife. Uh, and uh, on that weekend, there was a huge speculative wave against uh, the euro. And finally, uh, there was the bailout of Greece um, and uh, the whole mess, crisis mess, started. Um, the reaction was threefold. Well, the Troika uh, was uh, set up and took over responsibility. Uh, first for Greece, then came Ireland, then came uh, uh, Portugal. We all know the story. Uh, there was the rescue fund of, of uh, half a, a uh, um, 500 billion euros set up, later transformed into the uh, ESM as of uh, uh, September uh, uh, 12. The International Monetary Fund stepped in and uh, the European Bank uh, stepped in. And all this was done uh, for the major reason that uh, 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 a contagion effect, a massive contagion effect uh, was feared by the way uh, this was the first time in Europe that the East Asian crisis of 1997 uh, was uh, really taken seriously as something which might happen uh, to Europe in a currency union, which would, would of course be much more dramatic in a currency union because you don't have uh, the easy way out of devaluing uh, your currency. In general, the policy that was pursued can be characterized as a meddling through, muddling through uh, uh, policy, with the German government always being torn between the responsibility of, for the system and the domestic demands to stick to the rules. This is, if you look at uh, Chancellor Merkel's uh, uh, performance and record in the, uh, over these uh, months and years, this is the typical conflict uh, which uh, she went through and by and large politically she got credit for it. This is why she won the last election uh, quite uh, amazingly clear, um, but uh, it was an ever ongoing uh, conflict. The problem with this modeling through was apparently, I don't go through the story again, but uh, the, 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 uh, the, the upshot of, of this conflict was that the capital markets were not really convinced and were not really calmed down until in 2012, uh, it was in September, early September 2012, uh, um, ECB President Draghi announced uh, the OMT policy, the Outright Monetary Transactions Policy with his famous words, uh, we will do, uh, well, I rephrase it, we will do uh, what must be done, and believe me, believe me, it will be enough, these ways words. Uh, and uh, uh, this was uh, basically announcing uh, uh, a fire department, if you like, that, uh, uh, that uh, goes out if really uh, the, the markets uh, play havoc. So uh, that was something... Uh, which was uh, uh, in, in the German public viewed very critically because uh, the announcement uh, in uh, the opinion of many Germans meant that it was an announcement regarding uh, an, a completely open-ended uh, deficit financing of governments. I come back to this uh, point. Um, be that as it may, the policy was quite, in the short run, quite successful and uh, uh, it uh, calmed the situation and improved the business climate. Uh, I will briefly give you, I start uh, with figure five to eight and then come back to figure one to four. Um, here you can see what actual bond purchases were carried out until 2012 uh, in the uh, different uh, 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 central, from by the different central banks, the ECB, the Fed, and the Bank of England. Do I have a pointer? I don't. Okay, doesn't matter. You see the three uh, columns, and you clearly see a purchase of bonds as percent of GDP. You see that the Bank of England and the Fed intervened, uh, intervened 
much more dramatically uh, than uh, the ECB, and this has been so until today. Uh, actually, the OMT was in particularly successful because as an announcement, it needn't be carried out. It was credible enough as an announcement so that one could go without uh, actually uh, carrying it out. But an announcement has to be credible, and it is only credible if, in case of emergency, it is carried out. Uh, what I want to say here, it worked. And you can see from the balance sheet of the euro system uh, as a percentage of GDP that it massively worked. You see uh, uh, the balance sheet being at 20 to 23 percent uh, of GDP um, in the early years of the crisis. Then um, the, uh, the, in, uh, from, 19, uh, from 2011, the situation getting much more dramatic uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the credit system. Uh, of the ECB uh, with uh, uh, this shooting up um, as a percentage of GDP from roughly 20% to above 30%. And then, and this is almost, the peak is almost exactly at the time when the Draghi policy uh, was announced, then it, it, it came down again. Note, please, it's still not until today on the level it was before, but it is coming very close by now. Um, now, um, as to the economic climate uh, in the Eurozone, you can also see, uh, as measured by some monthly poll of the EU Commission, you can see uh, that uh, after the downturn, the massive, well, the, the first massive downturn uh, in the Eurozone, that's the red line, the periphery, it's the blue line, in 2009, which was the most awful year in terms of the contraction of the economy, then there was the recovery, but the recovery, contrary to the United States, was not sustained, but uh, uh, it, there was a, a worsening of the climate again between uh, uh, 2011 and 2012, and then came uh, in September 2012, the Draghi policy, and from that time on, uh, there was a substantial uh, improvement. Uh, a note, please, that all this happened, it's very important, uh, in, in a climate of low inflation. So uh, this is a historical comparison of consumer price inflation in Germany for a very long time, from 1958 to 1998 uh, with the German mark and then later uh, with uh, the euro. And you see that the euro times and also the very recent past uh, are, we are below uh, the 2%. As some people even fear deflation. We may come back to this point later on. But anyhow, there is no uh, inflation uh, visible. Now, again, let me come back to this point, uh, which is for the political climate extremely important, how you view the Draghi policy. You know, uh, this is one of the big issues in Germany, and you may have read about it, that the German Constitutional Court has just... Uh, set up a ruling, uh, uh, made a decision that uh, it considered the Draghi policy, the, uh, the OMT policy, as a hidden uh, a fi a deficit financing. So it uh, basically supported in its material argument the skeptical view of many economists in Germany. Not me, but many economists. I come to my point in a second. Um, but at the same time, the Constitutional Court was uh, 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 pragmatic enough to say, we're not in charge of deciding this. We shift it to uh, the European Court in Luxembourg, uh, who has to give us advice on this, because it's a European matter. It's a very uh, uh, clever uh, some say too clever way uh, of deciding the issue. Anyhow, the capital markets, the financial markets cannot yet be sure that the OMT policy, that the fire department can go on uh, and can stand ready for future crises. So there's still a big question mark here uh, in this respect. My personal view is, as a liberal economist, I must say, although my, many friends of mine see things differently, uh, I uh, think that the OMT policy was an extremely important short-run measure to stabilize the situation. It is not a long-run solution, 
This is absolutely clear. But nobody ever pretended that it was, an, uh, was a, a, a long-run solution. Uh, nobody pretended that uh, these countries could simply rely on printing money to get rid of their problems. This could not be uh, uh, reasonably uh, uh, pretained. Now, um, uh, the question is then, if you have the fire department uh, um, in, in the emergency uh, case of a crisis uh, stepping out, uh, how can we keep up the pressure on the countries uh, to reform, to go for reforms? And the question, of course, what has happened uh, in terms of reforms in the last few years? Well, um, my answer, and this is the third part of my uh, lecture, my answer is a lot has happened. This is also a little bit at variance with the perception in Germany in particular. Many Germans think uh, not much happens uh, in, in, the, uh, in the southern periphery countries. But we look at some numbers and they show us that this is simply not true. If you look at uh, this graph, <coughs> Uh, this is the degrees of austerity. This is actually what is shown here from a minus 5 to a plus 15 scale. This is the change of the structural deficit in the public budget, interest payments excluded as a percentage of GDP, in the crucial years 2010 to 2013. Basically, it says how much did the country save. Okay. And here you see Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Spain, all the crisis countries really be on top. Uh, and uh, so uh, in the case of Greece, it's an absolute massive cut, a massive cut, which uh, in, in, in this dimension has never happened in any other uh, uh, European countries and certainly not in Germany. So uh, to say that the Greeks, uh, the, Gre uh, the Greeks do nothing is really completely wrong. Uh, uh, they, ha they have gone for a tough consolidation and the other countries uh, have done the same. Now, if you um, and uh, in the lower part, you find, of course, the, the, the stable core uh, of uh, the European Union. You find Sweden, you find Finland, you find Germany, you find Austria, and all the rest of it. Now, if you look at the second graph here, this is the current account deficit of the five crisis countries in the Eurozone. Here, Italy is added, Italy, Spain, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland as a percentage of GDP. So if you look uh, um, how uh, uh, um, the current account developed in the long run from 2000 on, 2001 on, you see that they started with a moderate deficit of minus 2% of GDP. Then you have this dramatic uh, opening up of the deficit, which was completely unsustainable at the time until 2008-2009 to minus 7% almost. And then from that time on, you have a first step of improvement. And then in the very recent past, from 2011 to 2013, you have a substantial improvement. So you have a, a current account surplus, a moderate current account surplus now in these countries. So in other words, the absorption, the whole absorption of the economy, government spending, private spending, has dramatically uh, uh, um, uh, uh, cut, uh, being cut back in the countries. So in the broad sense, saving is really going on. Now, some people say that this is only due to the fact that uh, the countries uh, import less but do not export more. So uh, that it's basically only the consequence of the massive recession they are going through. Please remember that Greece uh, has, uh, has been shaved off 25% of its GDP. This is, uh, has not happened in Germany since the Great Depression. Uh, and uh, in the case of the other kind of periphery countries, uh, it's a couple of percentages. Uh, it's, it's not quite as high, but a couple of percentages. But um, let's look at the picture, um, whether it was only due uh, to uh, um, the cut in imports. And the answer is no. There has also been a substantial improvement of exports. Um, uh, um, uh, as you can see uh, here in this graph, um, um, you see uh, the clear, uh, uh, the, the, uh, from 2003 to 2013, uh, you see first long period 
of imports running ahead of exports, then the cutback due to, uh, uh, with, uh, with something like uh, um, uh, um, uh, a, uh, a trough reached uh, in 2009, and from then on, imports rising again, but then in the last uh, uh, two years going significantly down, but exports rising all over the time uh, since 2011. So there is a substantial improvement on the supply side as well in these countries. And let me finally look at a more, a more qualitative indicator. This is an indicator that is uh, uh, um, compiled by the OECD, it's an indicator of reform zeal. This is basically of the, uh, a measure of the reactions to implement OECD recommended reforms in the different countries uh, uh, compiled into an index. And here you see uh, Greece and Ireland on top, Portugal and Spain not far, far away. And uh, so, so again, you see uh, 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 reforms going on in these countries. Uh, other countries like uh, Germany uh, and Luxembourg uh, uh, and Sweden uh, well, um, uh, have done much less reforms, no reforms at all, basically. Um, uh, but, and note, please, uh, a difficult case is France. Uh, France needs quite a bit of reforms, but has been dragging its feet uh, in the last two years. So the picture uh, clearly shows in the crisis countries something has happened. Um, note again that what has happened and what has uh, 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 further to happen in these countries is uh, that uh, uh, we need structural reforms, deep structural reforms, which take time. Uh, and by the way, these structural reforms are very different in the different countries. In Germany, there is a tendency of saying, these guys have so simply to do the same what we did 10 years ago. You know that we had a, a reform package, it's called the Hartz Reforms, uh, basically reform under, uh, reforming our labor laws. Now, uh, I think this is a distorted picture because Greece doesn't really need to reform the labor laws. What Greece needs is a working tax administration, a working, uh, 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 a working legal system as a whole. Uh, if I summarize it in one uh, nutshell, uh, it is simply getting rid of the failed state and getting closer to a well-functioning administration uh, that is, makes the country an interesting place to invest. This is uh, what is needed in Greece. Now in Spain, um, in Spain it's in fact a very inflexible uh, labor market, the same with Italy. Uh, so I mean, it's a different and diverse story uh, and uh, um, simply uh, there, uh, there is no simple cure uh, uh, for all of them. Uh, so one has to look, notably the Troika has to look really very closely at the structural deficits that have to be cured in the different countries, and they are different uh, according to um, the historical uh, circumstances. Now, that's the picture of Europe at the moment. We have Germany and the, in, uh, the northern industrial core of Europe. Uh, I call it the northern industrial core, having recovered relatively easily, Germany having nice growth, but Austria as well, Sweden as well, Denmark as well. And we have the southern rim countries who went through an ordeal, if you like, of adjustment, really cutting away all the convergence that was achieved in the 10 years before, cutting, shaving it away again. And then we have the Eastern European countries, which were most of them relatively stable in the crisis, except uh, Hungary, uh, but uh, um, uh, even countries who went through deep crisis early on, like Estonia and Latvia, did the adjustment, by the way, uh, for good political reasons, because uh, they have the Russians next door, uh, so uh, they, it's, it's a matter of national pride uh, to get back uh, to uh, stability. Uh, so the situation is one, if you like, of a uh, divided uh, Europe. Now, um,
the problem of this situation is that it's not, there's no way back. You know, the bubble that burst uh, in the course of the crisis means that you cannot now again go for a bubble in the domestic service sector, uh, in the non -trade, what we economists call the non-traded goods sector of the economy, because that was not sustainable, as the development shows. We need a push of integration into the global and European division of labor of these countries. And if I tell you, when I tell you that Greece, a country of roughly 10 million people, had a, an export quota of 13%, if you take physical goods alone, manufacturing, and if you take physical goods and services together uh, with ship, uh, shipyards uh, uh, being included, uh, ship services, I'm sorry, um, then you are at something like 22, 23, 24%. Germany, a country eight times as big, has an export quota of more than 40%. You know, a country like Greece should have an export quota, maybe like Holland, 60% at least. So it turned its back for a long time, it turned its back to Europe, and it has to reintegrate uh, into Europe. Uh, so uh, this is a very fundamental change of policy. And it's really getting, uh, getting Europe back into symmetry, if you like. Germany, with a huge current account surplus, must have a domestic expansion over the longer run, not engineered by massive uh, wage rises, but by a general increase of domestic absorption, given the fact that we have tighter labor markets, this will come in due course, I'm pretty sure. Um, and the rest of it, uh, the crisis countries, must do exactly the reverse. So the growth must come from the traded goods sector in these countries. And that requires competitiveness. Uh, it's easy said, but much harder done. And you don't, uh, competitiveness doesn't fall from heaven uh, as uh, countries uh, with a long export, successful export record uh, know. Now, this is the big uh, challenge uh, in Europe. And I think we are only at the beginning of this process. You know, the basic switches that have been set recently are okay, but this will not be enough. Um, uh, the countries, even a country like Greek, Greece, but certainly a country like Spain, um, must develop a sound manufacturing basis, plus tourism and whatever, whatever you have, but a sound manufacturing basis to get back on a sustainable growth track. The country which does have this basis already, and which is therefore in a much better shape in the club of the crisis country, is Ireland. Ireland got lots of valuable direct investment, notably from the United States, and is by now a highly modern economy, and the service bubble that burst in banking was bad enough, but the manufacturing sector survives. Uh, uh, the export quota uh, is high, and we see Ireland back at the international carbon markets already. So um, what I say is the switches are uh, set, uh, but uh, the growth potential um, the growth potential must really be tapped. Now, um, this is, of course, uh, like a straitjacket that you cannot escape from. And that is true because these countries are members of the Eurozone. But let me emphasize at this point, it's not only a matter of the Euro. If you look at the Eastern European countries, Central and Eastern European countries, you find Poland, you find the Czech Republic, you find Slovakia, Hungary, all these countries, um, except Slovakia. Slovakia has already the Euro, but the others have not. But they did not go uh, in, uh, during the crisis time for a heavy devaluation of their currencies. No, Poland didn't do that. They devalued a little bit, but not much, uh, because they want to remain member of the club 
of the, 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 the wider stability zone of the euro. So even if the eurozone, at the times when the eurozone were in a, in a deep crisis, the euro itself continued to play its role as an anchor in the European division of labor, an extremely important anchor for the eastern, central and eastern European countries, but also, by the way, oddly enough, for Switzerland. Switzerland uh, in 2011 decided to tie the Swiss franc to the euro because otherwise the country would have had a, a vast revaluation of the Swiss franc uh, and uh, uh, maybe a deep recession. So what I want to say is the euro, despite all the problems, uh, the euro survived as the stability anchor in Europe. Uh, and by now, you know that we have uh, 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 Latvia joined the eurozone. Uh, so it remains uh, attractive. So what I want to say is um, thinking about models of a Europe without the euro, as is now fashionable in Germany, especially politically, on the right wing we have a new party. It's called the Alternative für Deutschland, Alternative for Germany. And it is claiming, let's get out of the euro. Uh, well, I personally think this may be a, a, nice, uh, uh, a, a nice child's play uh, for model builders, econ economists, to build models. But it would, would be a disaster in Europe uh, if a country like Germany or whatever would decide to leave the Eurozone because we don't want to, uh, want to pay for the others or support the others. Okay, let me then come to my final point before we enter the discussion. What do we need in terms of reforms on the Euro level, on the EU level? I was talking about the national governments who do the jobs but have still big jobs to do in the future. Um, and uh, in terms of a supply side policy, improving the supply and locational conditions in their countries. Um, and uh, however, we do also need some reforms on the EU level. Well, the first reform package must be the lesson drawn from the last decade. Please note that all these bubbles did not fall from heaven. They gradually built up. And there was no coordination, no control, no surveillance of these bubbles. So this must definitely change. The gradual erosion of the stability pact that happened through the back door in the last decade in a world of low interest rates, that must not be repeated again. So this was the basis for the so-called six-pack decision uh, in uh, December 2011, uh, uh, which basically entails uh, strengthening of the budget surveillance, strengthening of the enforcement and action against excessive uh, deficits. I think, um, um, I think this is the right way to go. Of course, whether it will actually work in practice is a completely different matter. I think we need a much stronger coordination of fiscal policies in the years to come. Um, and uh, um, I think there is an opportunity, there is a chance to get that. Because due to the crisis, we now have a, 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 a far-reaching European public discussion about macroeconomic matters. You know, uh, 10 years ago, if you asked a German, even a well-informed German, uh, what about budget policy in Spain or Greece? He would have shrugged his shoulders. He didn't know. Nothing. Today, look at the papers. You find detailed information on what the, on what the Greek uh, finance minister does, what the Portuguese finance minister does, and what the Spanish finance minister does. We, we begin to have a European public, and we desperately need a European public to get the pressure to, for coordination. Okay. Note that this does not mean that we need to have a, 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 a unique European Minister of Finance or Minister of uh, the Economy. I don't think that this is necessary. We need decent coordination on, the high, on a high level, uh, and I think this is possible. So the second point uh, is we need... Uh, uh, that's my pet project, if you like. Uh, we need 
a new growth and a new regional policy in Europe. Uh, I don't want to go into the details because this is EU policy, which is extremely complex. But so far, Europe had a so-called cohesion policy. The cohesion policy worked basically like this. You take the per capita incomes in the different regions and countries, and then you pour money into the poorest regions so that they can catch up in terms of per capita income. Okay? That le uh, led, in my view, to some good results. But it also led to a lot of perverse results. I give you an example. Take Greece. Uh, Greece, to 60%, consists of two cities or metropolitan areas. The one is Athens, the other one is Thessaloniki. Now, when you have, when you look at the per capita incomes, these are, of course, the richer parts of the countries. If you go to some remote Greek island, you get much lower per capita income. But it doesn't really make sense to pour money into, into, into infrastructure projects in a remote Greek island. A bit of tourism, but not much. So if you really want to strengthen the innovative capacity, the innovative industrial capacity of these countries, that will develop in the urban areas, in the wider urban areas, where the universities are, where the technical schools are, where the uh, well talented people are. So you have to redirect the money, the support, to uh, the regions where there is the growth potential. By the way, I'm really talking about my own experience. I think I said it this last time in, in June last year in, in Eastern Germany. I was Minister of Finance of a poor state. And we got a lot of money from the EU. And, uh, well, most of it was, of course, nicely uh, allocated. Uh, but some of it uh, was really in projects uh, which were uh, absolutely uh, not helpful for the innovative industrial capacity of a region. And that is the future and not some uh, consumption. By the way, the, uh, the, uh, the consumption part even led to a pumping up of the bubble because usually you get some construction works done and then afterwards you have a remote infrastructure and that's basically it. So it, it uh, uh, um, uh, uh, supported the, uh, the, the bubble expansion of the non-traded goods sector. So I think we need a fundamental reform of these uh, policies uh, and uh, uh, that will be, must come onto the, the agenda in the next few years. If we don't do that, we really run the risk of uh, Europe drifting apart, which will make politics much more difficult. It's always easier to have a common policy uh, and a more harmonious policy when there is a natural convergence. So, in this sense, the crisis may be a chance to rethink policy. Now let me come to Germany's role. Um, well, at the moment, Germany is big, rich, and stable. Uh, nobody's loved when he's big, rich, and stable. Uh, this is what the Germans uh, uh, at this time experience, uh, that uh, the, uh, the country's in crisis. You know, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel is not uh, particularly... Uh, uh, loved in Greece at the moment, but that's perfectly normal in this kind of uh, uh, situation. But we do have, as the biggest country of the EU, the biggest economy, uh, centrally located, an industrial innovative powerhouse, which was in a crisis 10 years ago, did some homework, and is now in relatively good shape. We have to take over some responsibility for the whole system. We did hesitantly uh, in the crisis, in the Euro crisis. But I think in the years to come, Germany must be uh, something like a leading mo motor in the integration process. I like to compare this to the American role after the Second World War with the Marshall Plan. Uh, in the Marshall Plan, which supported the integration of Europe, um, it was, of course, in particular infrastructure investment. Today we are more talking about knowledge-intensive investments. You know, good old Europe will not survive in an international division of labor uh, by producing bulky stuff. Uh, we have to use our brains, and even countries like Greece, Spain, 
uh, Portugal, Italy anyway, um, will not uh, compete, cannot compete in the long run with Bangladesh. This doesn't make sense. Uh, they need to move up the quality ladder. They have to improve their R&D spending. They have to move into more innovative segments of the economy. That's the only way it can go uh, for uh, most uh, of uh, Europe. So um, we um, have to stay, uh, as Germans, uh, we have to support this process. I think uh, there is no um, way of uh, looking back uh, and uh, 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 any type of isolationism. That will cost money, but uh, it, uh, the more important thing uh, than the money is uh, the political goodwill uh, and uh, to really go for this uh, kind of expansionary uh, strategy. Now, um, um, the problem with the German policy, I'm now uh, finishing up with a view on German policy right now, is uh, um, uh, I'm afraid I'm a liberal, I'm not part of the government, I'm not even part of the parliament, but uh, um, uh, the grand coalition that we now have is not uh, really uh, uh, pursuing uh, a path uh, which uh, looks uh, 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 very fertile for the future. You may have read uh, that uh, uh, um, the German government, despite the demographic changing, we are, uh, changes, we are in an, living in an aging society. Uh, um, uh, there have been uh, a general uh, pension uh, adjustments, uh, minimum wages uh, will be uh, introduced, uh, um, which is completely contrary to the flexibility that we have gained in the last 10, 15 years. And in terms of energy policy, we are on a, a very questionable track. Uh, if you see that the United States has very low energy prices now, uh, the competitive situation in the world has completely changed due to the reindustrialization of the US. I think this is a very dangerous path. And it's not what a growth motor uh, in uh, Europe uh, should really do. Now, uh, therefore, uh, I'm skeptical uh, on uh, uh, the, the domestic uh, policy that uh, Germany is pursuing at the moment. Uh, let me close by saying that um, Europe clearly went through an extremely hard time. The situation has significantly improved. The euro has stabilized, will remain stabilized if we don't get really bad surprises in the years to come. But I don't expect these surprises because I think that uh, the macroeconomic uh, uh, gears are set in the right uh, direction. Crisis is an opportunity for reform in the long run. And uh, uh, I, nevertheless, I, uh, of course, do not expect anything like a miraculous dynamics of the old continent. But uh, I think that uh, in knowledge-intensive production in the worldwide division of labor, uh, Europe should, have, uh, should be able to secure a safe place. Other regions, like Asia, uh, will grow much faster. But that's absolutely natural, that we uh, uh, go through a kind of relative shrinkage uh, relative, uh, uh, in comparison uh, to the rest uh, of the world. Uh, note, please, at the end, one political note. If you look at Ukraine at the moment uh, and uh, the really uh, uh, a difficult political situation, you see that Europe, as a, 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 a shining example, even if it hasn't shined so nicely recently, is still existent. And after all, after the two days at the Asian Leadership Conference, I realize that despite all the really uh, powerful growth that this region has had, and notably South Korea has had, the political cooperation in the region is, of course, not, uh, not yet remotely comparable with what we had in Europe, and this gives us a chance in Europe uh, to keep pace. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Professor Paquet, for very, very illuminating and interesting coverage of the current European economic and political terrain. Uh, you touched on many, many uh, critical issues. Uh, for clarification on terminology, you uh, mentioned a few times export quota. I, I think what you meant was uh, 
trade dependency or export, uh, the, the proportion of export yes. and GDP. That's what you meant, yes. export quota for clarification for the record. I think uh, that is what uh, Another very interesting point you made was the, about the Greece, uh, the regional economic policy. You know, in Korea, we have very restrictive policy uh, for the metro Seoul metropolitan area growth for, you know, for political reasons rather than economic reasons. And we have uh, uh, a debate, of course, among economists, and, but it's really a political uh, uh, decision but whether it makes sense economically or not. But so I thought that uh, it gives us a food for thought uh, for Koreans as well. You know, uh, as you <clears throat> uh, well described, the European policy uh, reactions to the problem has been muddling through. But with the muddling through, uh, policy stance, as you said, I fully agree that the European, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, union as a uh, as a group made a substantial progress uh, on fiscal side and the banking and financial side too. If uh, someone talked about the banking union. Uh, Maybe a decade ago, people would thought this you know, out of his mind, but now a substantial progress is made there. But having said that, there's still a lot to be done, as you, you, you said. And then another point you <clears throat> made uh, regarding the German responsibility struck me, as you know, you read the Financial Times and uh, Paul Krugman at New York Times, and they will always say Germans are doing enough. Uh, particularly uh, the, in the consumption side and to say, you know, you benefited so much from uh, the, the, uh, the, the, Euro, the introduction of uh, Euro and, uh, but you have now uh, the responsibility to support uh, the European recovery and perhaps uh, again wage policy, as you said, um, it will, because the labor market will be tightening, so wage, real wage will, will increase. But they keep saying that the you, you German should have uh, as a, a government policy to increase real wage. In any case, uh, you mentioned the Marshall Plan after World War II uh, in the context of the German role. I thought this very interesting point, and uh, maybe we want to pursue to uh, further discussion on this. Now, with this, uh, let me invite the questions and comments from Dr. Kim. Yeah, Professor Kim. I'm Professor Kim of Songyun Gwan University. I was impressed by your really uh, um, touching uh, stories in uh, presentation. I would like to uh, I would give an uh, applause to the uh, the people of I mean you know in uh, crisis countries for having you know made all the efforts to get the economies back on the track. Uh, however, I have a uh, one comment and one question. Um, you had a long list of reasons why I mean these especially five you know, crisis countries been able to recover in terms of low inflation and uh, in increasing uh, current accounts uh, surplus of the balance, uh, balance ratio. Uh, perhaps your you know, leadership uh, played a very uh, great role because Chancellor Merkel, uh, you know, been very uh, popular among the people, so uh, leadership role is extremely important in getting the consensus from the public. Uh, now, the question is, you seem to be saying that the currency union has been now finally, I mean, prove, I mean proving, uh, I mean, turning out to be successful. Uh, is it uh, not likely to have a, what they call the double dip 
in a trap or problem because you seem to be barely uh, getting out of the, the trap now. But do you see, I mean, as a, as a practical economist, as a signal, you know, uh, perhaps these countries would go back to or, you know, fall back into the trap again, you know, what, uh, what they call the uh, double dip uh, phenomenon. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yes, please. Um, let me invite one more. Yes, yes from. Yes, yes uh, I'm Johannes Regenberg yeah. from the German Embassy. Thank you yes. very much for your very interesting um, presentation. I would have two uh, questions. First, you rather briefly or relatively briefly touched upon uh, European institutions and, and the need of reform in order to uh, harmonize. Um, um, fiscal policies, since we have a monetary union uh, while lacking a, a fiscal union in the European Union. And you mentioned the six-pack. Um, um, we can observe that the readiness of European governments, including or even first of all Chancellor, Chancellor Merkel, to give more competences to the Commission uh, or to communalize more competences in the fiscal and budgetary realm, give it to Brussels, this readiness is extremely limited. Um, so we have a kind of renaissance of intergovernmentalism. You will see that at the election uh, of the European Parliament and then the subsequent uh, re-election of key posts at the European Union, including the President of the Commission. And so it will be a power game of, of, of governments and it will be no uh, it's European institutions, first of all. So uh, w although we are on the right track, uh, where do you see kind of the maneuvering space to, to, to really deepen integration and to deepen reforms uh, on the uh, European um, uh, level. Um, the second point is on cohesion and fighting disequilibria. Uh, we saw with um, some Eastern European states and others that uh, European structural funds, funds were provided, but uh, the capacity of local administrations to absorb the money, to spend the money in the right way, you mentioned Sachsen-Anhalt, but uh, there are other examples of, of Eastern European countries who uh, obtained uh, kind of 16 or 18 billion of euros, but they were able only to spend 4 or 5 percent out of that sum. In the case, I think, of Bulgaria a couple of years ago. Uh, so how do you want to address these, um, uh, these, these problems that there is money, but the ability to spend to um, the money, the governance of these countries uh, is still, um, is still uh, quite, um, quite weak? Thank you. Okay. Why don't you invite one more, one more question from this? Barbara Zollmann with the Korean German Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, um, Professor Paquet, you touched upon the topic of um, domestic consumption that Germany needs to increase. Um, the same topic applies also to the Korean economy where also more emphasis uh, shall be put on domestic consumption. Do you have any advice uh, what the government can do in order to boost domestic consumption? Good, okay. Well, I uh, <coughs> go in reverse order <laughs> because right. this ties yeah. back um, um, to Paul Krugman. Yeah, yeah right, yes with his wonderful comments uh, uh, on uh, the German situation. Uh, is the micro working or uh, sh yeah, yes, yes. Is it working? Yeah, I yeah. see. Yeah. Uh, well, I am for expansion, but I am not for what I would call forced expansion. I think it should be market driven. Once we get closer to full employment in Germany, and we do get closer to full employment in Germany, uh, the numbers are quite impressive. Uh, uh, in the years, I think in two, three years, we will, uh, well, the unemployment rate will go down and down, labor markets will tighten, and that will get given a kind of natural pressure, uh, upward pressure on wages. I think this is the way of doing it. I am very skeptical about um, uh, either a, a, a deliberate <laughs> wave of wage increases mm -hmm which may destroy, if they go too far, too far, and the danger is great, they destroy what we have achieved in the past. And nobody would have, uh, it would, would be of no help for uh, anybody if uh, Germany, or for that matter Korea, uh, um, were, uh, were, were losing its economic strength due to a huge cost push. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, the same holds for government spending. 
Now, uh, you know that we have set up in the recent years a certain amount of credibility of the government due to what we call Schuldenbremse in Germany, well, well the, the legal requirement that budgets should be, should be balanced by the end of the decade, and they are ba balanced already now uh, due to the uh, nice development of the economy. That should not mean that we now suddenly step up huge spending programs on the government side. We, do, we need to do something in Germany for infrastructure, for instance. Um, uh, there, there is need, but the kind of Krugman-inspired huge spending spree uh, initiated by the government, I think, uh, I, I say it uh, clearly, uh, is, is an irresponsible policy. <laughs> uh, completely independent of the fact that this will never wash with the Germans. Mm. This is not the way we carry out macroeconomic policy in Germany. It may be a little bit of a, of a, 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 of the, of a perspective of a highly respected uh, American intellectual, but uh, um, I'm not so sure uh, whether uh, in the time of, times of huge spending that America went through uh, that this was a particularly smart policy. So I want to make not, let, let me put it in a nutshell, I want to make not the strong mm. countries weaker, but I want to make the weak countries stronger. So at the end of the day, we get a sustainable, intensified division of labor in Europe and the world, and not um, uh, some uh, uh, locomotives uh, that put up steam uh, by government uh, spending. Now, um, uh, to the questions of the European uh, uh, policies, I'm terribly afraid uh, I don't have easy solutions. Institutional questions are the most difficult in the world. And one cannot not magically uh, change these institutions and the spirit in which they are served. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the, uh, we need more surveillance. We need a stricter handling of coordination. But uh, I'm, uh, this has to be done in a kind of consensual fashion. I would, in the present political climate in Europe, you mentioned the European parliamentary elections, it would not be popular at all if we make a huge daring step towards the centralization of, of, of authority in Brussels. I think then, then we really get, in trouble, get into troubled water. Uh, in, uh, you know, there are many anti-European <coughs> parties now, populist anti-European parties, uh, in Europe by now. Look at France uh, with uh, Le Pen. Look at Holland with Wilders. Uh, look at Austria with Strache. The party, the FPÖ in Austria, gets more than, uh, uh, more than 20 percent of the vote in normal elections. So in Germany we now have the problem as well, but as a, at a still lower level. But um, if you overdo it at this point, you may more destroy more than is good. I think, pragmatically speaking, as the situation has stabilized, let's look for a kind of evolution <laughs> of this uh, coordination uh, in the next few years um, and strengthening it step by step, and especially what I was calling the Europe, develop the European public, a European public discussion which is developing, and then we may uh, uh, take further steps in a couple of years. We need a breathing space at the moment in Europe. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we, uh, the EU will become extremely unpopular. Now, uh, as to the money, the problem of the governance uh, in the uh, countries like Bulgaria, Romania, or whatnot, mm. uh, I perfectly agree with you that there is a big problem of governance uh, in uh, uh, quite a number of countries, and that for a very long time, the EU watched the problem without doing anything. You know, in, in, uh, in, 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 in Greece, for instance, Greece does not have, just to give you one example, Greece does not have a reliable land register. And, the, and despite the fact that we have a, a, a massive EU subsidies on agricultural uh, since uh, the, uh, uh, Greece is members of the EU since 1981. Nobody uh, did anything to improve the situation in Greece. Uh, there has to put more pressure on these issues. Uh, many of the inefficiencies we have 
are the result of incompetent governance, uh, governments and a lack of reasonable governance and, of course, uh, uh, the existence of uh, corruption. Now, um, uh, Professor Kim, uh, the leadership question I leave uh, uh, unanswered. Uh, you're right that uh, um, uh, Chancellor Merkel has a, is very popular and has a good reputation in some countries. It, she doesn't have such a good reputation in Greece. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, uh, um, uh, I think that uh, uh, nevertheless, um, the muddling through, we wasted time. We got on the right track finally, but we did waste time. We could have done all this much more energetically and earlier <clears throat> if we had had a feeling for the dimension of the problem. Um, now, um, the question of the trap, it's very hard to say. Um, uh, um, I, 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 my, my interpretation of the figure, figures and my visual inspection, I was in Greece a couple of months ago and had a very close look uh, at the, uh, uh, the problems. Um, I think that uh, the core problem of these countries is really the shift from the non-traded to the traded goods sector. That is gaining competitiveness. And uh, uh, the political leadership of the countries has to put this on the agenda. And they do. Look, well, at least they claim they do. Look at Italy now. Renzi has a ref wants to build up a reform agenda. Let's wait and see what happens. One never knows in Italy. Um, um, in Greece, uh, um, uh, something is done, uh, a lot of things have happened, despite the existence of a dangerous left-wing mm. and right-wing populist movement. The country has remained stable. Spain, Rajoy, uh, has pursued uh, quite a few, uh, quite a reform. So I'm not so pessimistic, but it has to be done with leadership <clears throat> in the countries and support uh, from outside, a kind of cooperative uh, spirit. Mm -hmm. let, let me uh, ask you the it's a related question and that is that given the European political situation developing in uh, many countries and particularly in, in Germany now you have a coalition government grand coalition uh, do you foresee, predict or this coalition government's uh, policy toward the Europe will change or, or, or uh, uh, go as it is. Well, it, 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 will there be more Europe or less Europe? You think the, what the new government will, policy will do? I think there will be no fundamental change uh, uh, between the policy that the Christian Democratic Liberal Coalition did uh, and the uh, Christian Democratic Social uh, uh, Democratic Coalition does now with respect to Europe. Mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of continuity uh, in our policy in Germany. Uh, uh, it's pragmatic, it's muddling through, uh, but no, not really grand visions, uh, but by the way, uh, uh, in general, uh, it works. I don't expect much change. I would expect mass, much change if a party like the Alternative für Deutschland, uh, with a strong anti-European attitude, uh, would come to power. So the difference between the former coalition and the, uh, uh, the uh, present coalition is much more in domestic issues uh, when it comes uh, to questions of uh, 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 regulation, minimum wages, pensions, uh, which uh, are not the core of European policy, although they do have influence, <laughs> of course, uh, on the weight uh, and, and the strength of, the German, uh, of Germany and its economy mm -hmm. in the European context. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, present Chair. <clears throat> If I may, that uh, I want to ask non-economical question, uh, <laughs> apart from uh, today's uh, topic, that um, I heard uh, from you that um, that Germany had uh, uh, for unification, Germany had uh, good support and blessing from neighboring countries and uh, power countries, including Russia, 
And uh, in order for Korea to be unified, uh, we need uh, support from uh, neighboring countries and uh, the, the power countries. And critically, uh, the support from uh, US, Japan, and China will be critical. Uh, for China, that uh, so far, uh, North Korea served as their buffer zone um, of not having American army close to uh, their border. Uh, however, that um, they may be afraid that if un unified, uh, that uh, American troops can come near their border. And uh, how we, uh, say, uh, mediate between the interests of these two power countries. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Lim, please. Yes, you have a question? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. My name is Lim from Diplomacy Magazine. I, I will give you the very simple question. Oh, would you tell me what is the impression on the, you know, Park Geun-hye's speech uh, the other day? <laughs> okay, yes. Okay, that's enough. Oh, that's, a, uh, that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. uh, I have to be a diplomat. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Uh, well, to the first question, uh, um, uh, this is, of course, deep water. Um, uh, clearly, uh, German unification was only possible because we had uh, friendly neighbors uh, and because there was an understanding of the allied powers of the uh, Second World War, the UK, France, the US in particular, and at the time the Soviet Union. It was a window of opportunity which was open in the Gorbachev time and uh, Kohl and Genscher, our great uh, leaders, uh, uh, use that window of opportunity. Without that, we wouldn't have German unification or we would have had a German unification with a lot of trouble. We didn't have trouble. Uh, that was due to the international understanding. I think it's, in principle, the same in the case of Korea. My personal opinion is, that this is a really personal judgment, uh, which... Uh, I dare to make, but uh, which is, of course, not based on any academic or scientific analysis. Um, North Korea looks to me like a place which may at some time implode in the sense that uh, um, maybe a leader dies, maybe, maybe something happens which, uh, which, which makes the system which is so extremely inefficient and inhuman much worse than Eastern Germany ever was, mm -hmm. that there may be, may be some uh, instability emerging. And that day, when that day comes, nobody mm -hmm. knows when it comes, whether it comes, when it comes, um, then it is extremely important mm -hmm. to have a good working relationship between the powers around. And you were mentioning the powers. I think the most decisive powers are obviously uh, China and the United States. And for China, I think, in a kind, China, China will not be interested in a destabilized, completely de a failed state or whatever, you know, mass migration going on suddenly um, uh, and, and what not. Um, they want to have, uh, for their economic uh, interests, uh, heavily uh, uh, trading with, with, with uh, uh, South Korea, so they want to have some stability. But they don't want to have the Americans in North Korea. So that would be the basis for negotiations. Um, and uh, there, there could be models. You know, if you have a four plus two talk, let's say the US, Japan, China, and Russia at the table, plus the Koreas, mm -hmm. uh, like the four, four plus two talks in the case of Germany. But the decisive issue is China and America, I think. Um, and I, I guess a model of a, a Korean unification would look differently from that of Germany. You know, we are, at the end of the day, due to the weakness of the Soviet Union, hmm. we have NATO now, hmm. united Germany within NATO, hmm. and NATO is stretching uh, uh, up to Belarus, uh, so uh, uh, almost until the, the, the Russian uh, up to the Russian hmm. border. But that was a window of opportunity. This, you won't have that window, because hmm. China is strong hmm. and getting stronger. 
So, I mean, we discussed this mm. yesterday mm. In, 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 at the Asian conference, uh, leadership conference, in a wonderful dialogue mm. between a Chinese and an American, mm. uh, Robert Kaplan, mm. was on the, mm. uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, um, the panel, and uh, that was the upshot of the whole thing. Mm. Talk, talk, and talk. Keep links uh, um, <laughs> so that there is a climate where, uh, when the day comes, one can uh, start uh, to negotiate matters. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, uh, uh, my reaction to Minister Park's speech. Mm. Well, I don't want to say anything about the speech itself, um, but about what my impression is, uh, what uh, has happened in the last, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the last two years. Uh, at fir I was the first time uh, uh, in Seoul in 2011, uh, um, and uh, uh, I'm now the third time here. And I have the impression that um, uh, it is whoever did it, but the, the issue of unification is positively on the agenda. Uh, and uh, that is very important. It's not, not to say that the day, <laughs> next day we get unification. <coughs> Nobody knows. Yeah. But uh, somehow to be prepared for the event in the sense that you have a scenario plan, analyzing very carefully German unification, with all the differences, history never repeats itself. And, and uh, setting up a committee, I found this is an excellent idea to set up in a committee uh, um, uh, in, within the government uh, who works on that seriously. And then keeping up the, uh, uh, the, the dip all diplomatic channels, uh, uh, that, that's, that's the way of dealing with the question. And it seems to me that there have, has been uh, some progress uh, in, uh, in this respect in the last two years. Um, this is the limit uh, of where I go for diplomatic reasons. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, very good, very good. Well, well, with this we have to end. You know, uh, President Mitterrand used to say that uh, he likes uh, Germany so that he needs uh, two Germanys instead of uh, he likes to have two Germanys. <laughs> right, but that's what the point. Uh, Chancellor Kohl was able to persuade uh, President Mitterrand with uh, particularly the introduction of uh, Euro. And so it is very important, very, very critical to keep good relations with our neighboring countries and, and, and uh, China, U.S., and Japan as well. So. Uh, again, of course, Germany too, but, uh, <laughs> but in any case, uh, we need uh, uh, the international support and the, and the participation. Well, with this, we have to end, and uh, maybe we should invite um, uh, Professor Parquet uh, uh, in the near future uh, to celebrate his party's uh, the, the, uh, winning in the election <laughs> and also <laughs> maybe Korean unification too. <laughs> Anyway, okay, thank you very much. Please join me in this.